Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Myra Topic on the topic of intellectual property rights. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Every week we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of external affairs here to the studio in Waterloo. Today my guest is Myra Tofik. She is a professor of law and director of the Law, Technology and Entrepreneurship Clinic at the University of Windsor. She's also a senior fellow with the International Law Research Program here at CG. Myra, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. I wonder if we could just start um, with a seemingly simple question. Um, when we talk about intellectual property law, what are we talking about exactly? Well, actually, I mean, in a way, what we're talking about is an umbrella of rights. When we use the term intellectual property, in a way, there's no substance behind that. That the, 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 those two words, what they really denote, are a series of independent kind of legal regimes um, that you know we're more maybe familiar with: copyright, trademark, patents, industrial designs, trade secrets. So a bundle of different forms of intellectual property rights over different co aspects of human creativity and human innovative capacity. Um, you know, and so th and they've they we've kind of recognized and protected these rights for a long time. Um, so the, the, that's so we're talking about intellectual property, we're really talking about separate legal systems or regimes to govern um, what I tell my students, sort of the product of human creative uh, endeavor. And again, another seemingly simple question, what's the rationale for having these laws in the first place? Well, I mean, the rationale is actually quite, you know, if you go back in time and you look at the origins of the, the first patent laws, whether in, you know, Europe or North America, if you look at the origins of the first copyright laws, what they were ultimately designed to do was to promote the advancement of, you know, innovative, innovation and creativity by offering to innovators an incentive to disclose basically to put their ideas out there for for the public to benefit from so that knowledge can be transferred people could build on the knowledge improve on it and societies sort of would would advance the both economically and culturally and so patents which are designed to protect um, the products or the fruits of scientific endeavor I mean scientific right. sort of gen you know uh, broadly speaking um, the 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 sort of the the, the 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 patent rights developed out of a desire, sort of the among policymakers, to see those inventions put to market, so that people right. could use them, benefit from them, etc. In exchange for that that encouragement to put the invention out there, the inventor gets a period of exclusivity exclusivity within which that per no one else can manufacture, sell, or whatever the invention right. uh, without the inventor's permission. It's the same on the copyright side, but copyright is designed to create to protect the fruits of creative endeavor, okay. literary, artist, art, poetry, music, right. um, and the, the trade off is the same. I mean, there's an, an encouragement to disclose and disseminate in exchange for exclusive rights over the, the circulation, the printing, publishing, um, distribution of the work. And how is intellectual property regulated in Canada and how does that compare to other jurisdictions, say the United States? Well, I mean, most really most of, of inter most intellectual property rights are regulated by statute, so legislation. In fact, um, without the legislative regime, there's n there would be no uh, no way no protection at all. So, for example, without the Canadian Patent Act, um, you know, we wouldn't have a vehicle, um, uh, you know, sort of to protect and and, and to to, to um, there wouldn't be a vehicle outside of the statute to uh, to deal with the same or deal with the same intellectual pro form of intellectual property in the way in which it's protected. The same with copyright. There's a Copyright Act. There's a Trademarks Act in Canada. Um, other forms of intellectual property, so for example, trade secrets, those are not governed by statute. And okay. so there's a sort of it's um, the the, it's, the landscape, the intellectual property legal landscape in Canada is sort of a mixed bag. You've got most of the intellectual property rights defined by statute. Um, in some cases, though, we've inherited the British tradition, and we treat some forms of intellectual property sort of at, at common law, which is basically sort of within kind of a judge-made system of rules and regulatory schemes um, that are not statutorily uh, embodied in a statute. Right. And what about internationally? Do we have international law to help govern intellectual property? 
Yes, I mean, this sort of, you know, one of the things that happened, I mean, and we're talking about some of these bodies of law are quite old. We're talking about 18th and 19th century bodies of law. Um, one of the things about sort of the, 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 the sort of the, the, the products of one's mind or the fruits of one's mind or the, you know, is that they're easily shared, they're easily transported. I mean, if you think right. about um, 19th century, sort of the movement of books, and the book, you know, books in the 19th century were the mass medium uh, for the dissemination of knowledge and knowledge transfer. Right. And books are very portable. So, you know, sort of someone traveling from France to England carrying a book and a British printer sort of sees the book and thinks that would sell well in Britain, takes the book and sort of reprints it. And, of course, the French author gets nothing. And right. then the book is transported to the United States and the same thing happens. It became evident sort of in the late ni 19th century that some form of treaty, some form of state sort of engagement or arrangements over the sort of the, the easy, easy mobility of knowledge needed to be uh, established. And so the first intellectual property treaties originated in the 19th century to try and deal with that problem of the mobility of knowledge and sort of, it, you know, again, the, the lack of incentive. I mean, if, you know, you're sort of, you know, you've written the greatest novel of the 19th century and you put it out there and you know you can control, in, in, you know, you can control your British author, you can control the reprinting in England, but then once it goes to France or the States or you can't do anything about it, there's right. no incentive for you to continue to create. That's the argument. So international treaty systems were developed in order to give to this comfort, sort of security to authors and inventors that their works won't be uh, misappropriated without, without their permission in different jurisdictions. And so the Berne Convention uh, for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works originated in 1885, 1886. Right. Um, and it, it's, it, it continues in force to this day. It's now got hundreds of members. Um, and we have similar treaty systems for patents and trademarks and, you know, they operate somewhat each one operates somewhat differently. So when, when you know, we speak about intellectual property treaties, we really need to kind of carve out sort of the, the, the particular forms of intellectual property rights we're talking about. But we have a fairly complex range of treaties. Right. More recently, sort of so the Berne Convention, for example, was a purely, was a copyright treaty established in the 19th century and administered by the World Intellectual Property Organization based in Geneva, WIPO. Right. In the late 1980s, um, when it became, you know, as particularly the West was switching to a knowledge or was transforming its economy into the so-called knowledge economy, um, dealing with intellectual property rights as tradable commodities became a much greater issue. Right. Um, and so what we see now are two interrelated systems for the international governance of intellectual property rights. We've got the classic. IP treaties that are governed by the World Intellectual Property Organization, so the Berne Convention, the Paris Convention, I mean, there's a whole list of them. They are intellectual property specific treaties. And then you've got the WTO TRIPS, the Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, that are trade treaties that contain intellectual property codes. And, and so that's the sort of, there's been a shift I at the international level towards inter international trade treaties with IP um, uh, rules um, and you know I mean even though the the IP treaties themselves remain kind of an integral part of the international system we hear more about you know the the the, the trades the trade treaties they're right. the ones that have more bite they're the ones that um, you know have their inf much more enforceable their their stakes are higher in the international trade context than they are in the treaty system under WIPO. So WTO TRIPS, NAFTA, I mean, was the sort of end the, you know, now all the, the regional agreements like the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership, TPP, right. and all, those are all trade agreements that contain intellectual property provisions um, that treat IP rights as co tradable commodities. And so their focus is really to strengthen and deepen intellectual property rights and sort of the pushback right. often comes. Uh, from from people who say, you know, I, intellectual property is more than just a, a commodity to be traded. It you know it embodies cultural considerations. Right. Where you know, and so there's a lot of kind of discussion at the international level about how to balance the rights. And and just building on this, um, are these international organizations like WIPO, mm -hmm. like the WTO, uh, the NAFTA, um, dispute mechanism uh, bodies? Yeah. Are they able to enforce these treaties? Uh, and what are the 
What are the consequences for violating a treaty? I mean, that, that is probably one of the most significant changes that this international trade and IP rights regime has brought is this enforceability. Okay. Because all of the NAFTA has a dispute resolution sort of system that with kind of uh, the ability for the, the decision makers to actually impose sanctions on countries that don't comply with the, uh, you know, whatever obligations they've undertaken under those treaties. Similarly, the WTO TRIPS has a very sort of um, robust kind of uh, dispute resolution mechanism with the same possibilities and the thing that's sort of why you know these these treaties are so um, I mean why they're taken so seriously is that if for example Canada doesn't meet its obligations under the TRIPS agreement so it doesn't sort of enact legislation that meets the standards contained in the uh, IP code in the WTO if Canada is found to be at fault it, you know, the sanction sort of doesn't necessarily have to fall in relation to Canadian intellectual property. They, you know, we could be, we could have, you know, sort of be sanctioned against sort of our wheat or steel, right. you know, so that in other words, we could get hit in industries that may matter more to us than our intellectual property. Okay. Um, and so there's more bite to these uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. If you take the other side, the other regime, which is the WIPO, intellectual property treaties themselves, there was never, they never had enforcement uh, mechanisms built into them. Right. Um, a country that felt that another country was violating its obligations could go to the International Court of Justice for a remedy. It was always very, you know, it was not a, a good kind of a forum for dealing with these kinds of problems. The, the nice thing about the, the WIPO system, though, was that it was basically the, it was a political, in a sense, if countries were going to comply, I mean, they did, they did the best that they could, you know, when they signed on, and then pressure, sort of over time, would compel them maybe to increase right. sort of their level of protection or to expand kind of the types of intellectual property they recognized. So that it was done more at a, a staggered or staged way rather than the WTO, which was in some ways a much more aggressive imposition of higher standards on you know countries that for reasons that had nothing to do with intellectual property rights wanted to sign on to the trade treaty, um, but then had to inherit it Right. The, uh, the Western view of, of what intellectual property protection should look like. And just building on that, what is the incentive for a country like China or India to participate in this process when they could, you know, look at somebody's, a company's intellectual property, take it, mm -hmm. develop their own mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's huge economic gains to be yeah. made from that. What is their incentive for playing by these rules? <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, just sort of, uh, they're really, you know, at, at, at certain stages of sort of a country's economic and cultural development, um, there isn't an incentive to okay. play by those rules. And in fact, um, that, you know, that part of the argument that, for example, India and, and China and other countries have been making at the international level is that when the United States and was a developing country in the 19th right. century, it made very forceful arguments that British intellectual property, particularly copyright works, were too expensive for the American public. And so they needed to be able to reprint those works cheaply and so therefore not not you know getting permission from the author and not remunerating the author in any right. way because a democratic society needed sort of the advancement of knowledge and n knowledge sharing and it was only through books that they could you know and so there was this entire kind of um, uh, uh, system operating 19th century uh, in the 19th century United States and the laws facilitated this of basically sort of unauthorized reprinting or piracy for example of British copyright works and and sort of uh, and so at at the time, you know, I mean, intellectual property rights sort of are in the eye of the beholder. I mean, it depends <laughs> on what stage of your development sure. you are. I mean, when you when you become a, a, a produ mass producer of intellectual property, your best interest is, of course, is to make sure that you you open international markets for your products, and that the legal protections are strong in every country that you do business with right. when you're not. And Canada is always in this precarious, it's sort of an odd position because we've always been a net importer of intellectual property, but we play the game as though we're, you know, strengthened intellectual property rights are in our own national best interest. But if you're, you know, if you're econ once your economy starts to grow, once you, when you're a net, or wh when it doesn't, when you're a net importer, you don't have an interest in actually strengthening IP rights. So this, the carrot in a way that 
uh, the Americans and the Europeans when they went and developed their trade agenda, WTO, et cetera, for India and other countries among, you know, a number of kind of concessions was really the, the carrot was, well, if you sign on to this intellectual property system, you're going to benefit in other in areas of your right. economy, in other you know, manufacturing, sort of whatever s sectors, you're going to do better there. And in tr the trade-off is you'll have to develop IP systems like ours. Right. Um, and there was, there's been a lot of st sort of study done on the impact of the WTO trips on, you know, emerging economies in the developing world and sort of, you, you know, you, you force countries to build infrastructure and they have no capacity to really manage. I mean, they have no concept of patents there, you know, right. that kind of thing. They, they, you know, so there's sort of, it was, um, uh, um, so, so you have this discussion at the international level between kind of the, you know, the, for want of a better word, the, develop, the developing world and the industrialized world about the fact that, you know, and they make the same arguments that the Americans made in the 19th century, right. that these regimes are d deny them the ability to, uh, to grow their economies, to grow their cultures, to, to benefit from the creativity and the inventiveness of those around the world um, to be able to expand their own capacity. And so it's a very similar argument, and it's a very hard hmm. argument Honestly, you know, for the for the United States to really push back sure. on because there's such a uh, you know rich body of literature about right. their views way back when when they were a developing country. Right. Yeah. Now um, shifting gears a little bit, mm -hmm. you are heading up a project for CG that is looking at ways or strategies for providing low cost legal services to startup companies here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the project? why you're doing it, what you hope to accomplish. Thank you for asking. I actually, it's a project that d was born out of the number of years uh, I've been teaching at a law school in Ontario um, in an area in Windsor, Ontario, which is sort of, tr you know, economically, kind of st struggling eco economically, trying to diversify its economy and sort of paying a lot more attention to the question of stimulating startup and, right. and tech startups particularly. And when, you know, you look around, I mean, tech startups are very much dependent upon access to intellectual property legal expertise. You know, one of the things that's very, very critical at the beginning, the, the stage of sort of, you know, generating an innovative idea is that if you disclose that idea, you prevent, your, you, 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 you've denied yourself the ability to later patent it, sort of to right. claim an, an, intellectual, an intellectual property right over that uh, idea. And so, and so it's very important, just as a basic example for, you know, young innovators, you know, I mean, I use the, you know, sort of the, the, the quintessential 20-year-old engineering student who's now being encouraged to start a business around a great idea he or she might have, you know, d you know how are they going to get this knowledge that says to them, that teaches them right. that they shouldn't be disclosing and they shouldn't, you know, these sorts of, t you know, things that they need to know in order to, to, to give themselves the opportunity to uh, obtain intellectual property protection. And in, in Windsor, I mean, there's no, there are, I mean, there are very few intellectual property lawyers in Canada to begin with, and they're okay. really concentrated in the major city centers. So Windsor's not unique in this area, but, it, but Windsor, you know, it, it, for me, there were, there were no lawyers I could refer anyone to when I was getting questions about, right. you know, uh, well, I've done this, or I've created this, or where do I go? And so, and I mean, by the same token, we have a, you know law students who are extraordinarily keen and you know bright and willing and dedicated, who can provide some of the basic kind of legal um, information or legal right. services to these startups. And so I started this clinic, you know, at the University of Windsor to try and match law students with some of the the startup community, in order to try and help Windsor at least kind of to raise the its capacity to manage kind of the commercialization process for tech startups. And it led me then to thinking a lot more about uh, this quite, I mean, uh, you know, it was Windsor specific, but it, as, a, as, a, as I explained, it's not as though every other sort of city in the country is well served. Right. I mean, and so it became evident to me that it, uh, in general, um, we're not doing enough in Canada, and that's at the public policy level and the level of the legal profession, at the level of legal education. We're not doing enough to help shore up our commercialization capacity, um, and that has more significant consequences. It's not just about training law students at the University of Windsor to help local right. startups. Um, 
we talked about the knowledge economy. I mean, we're very much kind of in, in that gear now. Well, knowledge, you know, I mean, it, the a knowledge economy is based upon the protection of intellectual property because right. without that, the sort of the legal kind of uh, boundaries around in, in, innovation and, you know, creativity, I mean, ideas, as I say, they're easily shared. I mean, there's no, you know, it's the intellectual property rights that create the commodities that we can trade in our knowledge economy. And if we don't have a solid kind of infrastructure to provide the types of intellectual property services that the startup community is going to need, I mean, we're basing our economic um, success and future growth right. on the backs of these sort of small and medium enterprises. If we're relying on them and their businesses are intellectual property intensive, then I think we have an obligation, sort of as a, as a you know, sort of as say in the public, in, as a matter of public policy, to develop systems to help them kind of advance their uh, the, the, the commercial viability of their businesses, both domestically but more importantly, to know how to deal with um, managing their intellectual property rights in the international forum. Right now, you've recently raised this issue with the Law Society of Upper mm -hmm. Canada. Yes. Um, where is the law society on this issue? I, think str I mean, to be honest, it's a, t it's a difficult issue. It seems pretty simple. I mean, you sort of, you know, for example, one solution might be to have law students kind of fill some of the gaps under, you know, proper supervision and with all the sort of the, 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 the necessary controls in place. It's not that easy, sort of, um, and law societies generally, I think, tend to be... Um, um, you know, risk averse. Right. Uh, and so, the, I mean, there has been some movement. The Canadian Bar Association recently issued a report looking at the changing nature of the legal profession. And one of the things they recommended for it was that um, law societies look at expanding the rules to permit law students to do more with clients okay. than they currently can do. Um, the law society sort of, uh, you know, I think the profession itself is at a crossroads. I mean, I think we really, you know, there's great concern about the fact that a lot of Ontarians, for example, just to look at the situation in Ontario, are, uh, you know, can't access legal services because of cost. Sure. Sort of the, you know, and end up, you know, representing themselves before the courts. I mean, it's created this sort of significant um, access to justice issue um, and, and, and injustice right. uh, in the way legal services are delivered. Um, the, uh, you know, there, there are, of course, the, the internet now that provides kind of, you know, you could get legal advice from an American lawyer somewhere, and, sure. you know, whatever. It just, you know, and it's easy, right? I mean, it's easy access to these services that you can't, fa you can't get at an affordable price from a lawyer here necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating the situation, but that's the core of it. There's a growing kind of disparity between kind of the, the, the ability of most can, uh, most Canadians to, to afford kind of the costs of, of legal services. So the internet fills a gap and there's concerns right. over, of course, you know, the type of advice that's being given. I mean, you can't really, I mean, an American lawyer can't pretend to give legal advice about a Canadian in the sure. Canadian context. I mean, so there's all sorts of things, and you know, that I think the Law Society has got to um, come to terms with in terms of the changing nature of the profession. And so part of what I'm hoping these initiatives will do and my project here will do will be to put this question of, you know, um, capacity building for, for in, in intellectual property law for startups to put it on the policy agenda amongst the many other issues they have to deal Right. with but to get it up there so that we're starting to think about it and talk about it in a in a more considered way and um, how is the issue of intellectual property law evolving and I'm thinking about you know with these new technologies with the internet things like the open access mm -hmm. movement crowdsourcing uh, for problem solving um, is the law able to keep up with cha with changing technology well i mean there is you know with the when the who the in the 90s, or the internet, sort of, you know, um, there was all of this kind of these uh, these uh, scholars were writing about the death of copyright law right. because it would never be. I mean, copyright law was born of print technology. It was a, it really really dealt with reprinting books. I mean, that's what it started as. And you know, we've amended the law over time, and it's a quite actually been you know, and 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 our law is not that different from 
you know, most of the copyright laws around the world, um, you know, that it's actually been very, very, a very successful sort of uh, statute because it, it has absorbed new technologies. Radio came on, the, the act was changed to bring in, you know, copyright and, you know, trans in, in broadcasts and television. And so the internet, so some just seemed like, well, it's another technology copyright could deal with it. And others said, no, I mean, this signals the death knell of, of, of the regimes that were based upon kind of particular technologies that were now like centuries old. Right. And so crowdsourcing and open access movement, I mean, all of those, uh, those new kind of uses of technology in really incredibly innovative ways, all challenge, provide, provide the same challenge to the bodies of law right. that we had, you know, established based on certain technologies and the premises under which we enacted those laws. Um, those, those new developments are challenging kind of intele our intellectual property laws all the time. So the question will always be whether or not we, and we'll never, sort of, you know, rip the statute up and start from scratch. But right. the extent to which we could keep on revising or amending or, you know, the, the, the um, legislative drafts, the drafting now, you know, and the, the courts talk about sort of statutes that are technology neutral. So in other words, rather than crafting a statute around a particular technology, you create principles that could apply even as technology evolves. The biggest challenge to intellectual property and, and with the advent of of these technologies is really, I think, at the global level. I mean, right. it is about how you protect and enforce intellectual property rights at the international level. And so, you know, the, it's to me that sort of the larger piece of it is about enforcement rather than about n needing to radically rethink the way our laws are, are crafted. Right. And perhaps just to, to wrap up, um, where do you see this issue going? over the course of the next 10 years, 20 years? You know, I mean, intellectual property rights, I mean, at the international level especially, are becoming, they've become very, very complex. Even, right. the, even the statutory texts, which are you know, driven by what happens in the international system, are become very complex. If you look at, for example, the Copyright Act of 1921 and the Copyright Act of 2012, I mean, the, tec the technical detail in the in the most recent statute is virtually incomprehensible. I mean, it's sort of so. I think the complexity is going to lead us to, to to. I mean, it'll be uh, they'll be unworkable. We right. see it already in the patent concerns over kind of the way the ways in which patents and patent laws are manipulated to enable kind of um, new initiatives to sort of come on board that are, don't necessarily have uh, beneficial social value. The phenomenon of the patent troll, for example, or, you know, the sort of the, the, the entity that, that licenses or buys up patents doesn't use or doesn't manufacture the product, doesn't put it out there to market, right. instead kind of threatens lawsuits to collect sort of returns on the patent. I mean, there's, there's sort of distortions like these that are happening that people are increasingly becoming concerned about. So I think there'll be, it, it, I mean, I, at some point, the increase in complexity and sort of the unintended consequences resulting from a very complex and unwieldy system, I hope, <laughs> will lead us to sort of really kind of think about and go back to basic principles. Why did we um, decide? That, that intellectual property um, sort of, that, w that we would create something and protect something we call intellectual property. Why did we do that in the 18th and 19th centuries? Right. I don't think the underlying kind of uh, policy um, objectives have changed, have changed. And so I do think that, you know, sort of if we go back to basic principles um, as we sort of have created or as we continue along the path of chaos in intellectual property at the inter international level, I'm hoping there'll be a moment where we'll go back and right. think and contemplate uh, the reason, the, the, and contemplate and sort of think about why we enacted these laws in the first place and go back to basic principles. So, my, Myra, this okay. has been absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really okay. appreciate it. It's been fun. And thank yeah. you to our audience. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.